Becky Roberts is your presenter this evening. Becky is a land use specialist with the Center for Land Use Education. She provides training and resources for local elected and appointed officials and staff related to community planning and land use decision making. And Becky is ready to begin. All right, thank you, Karen. I appreciate it. I wanna thank you all for attending um, and I hope you um, enjoy the webinar and have a lot of takeaways from this. Um, this is meant to be a pretty high level overview of the plan commission. I imagine many of you are fairly new to the job. So I wanna review the roles and responsibilities of the plan commission. And I'm gonna be framing that within the context of some of the major land use tools and decisions that you're likely to encounter or be responsible for as a plan commission member. I will also be stressing some basic terminology as well as where to go for some additional resources. Like I said, this is a high level overview. So if you have some additional questions, uh, we do have additional training available. This is part of a series where we have some additional um, specialized topics. And we also have some past recordings and we can point you to handbooks and additional resources. So certainly please reach out if you have additional questions. You can also use the chat function throughout and we'll try to answer some questions at the end of the webinar. So before we get started, I'd like to launch a quick poll. This is simply seeing who is attending. So what is your role? And I know that many people wear many hats. So you're welcome to select all that apply. For example, you might be an elected official as well as a member of your plan commission, select them both. And also how many people are watching from your site? Um, so many of you are maybe attending individually. I know that some people will also use this as a nice training opportunity for their entire plan commission. So there might be a staff member who's hosting and inviting others to attend. Uh, so let us know um, how many are attending. And Lynn, I'll let you launch that poll. I'm not seeing it quite yet. Let's see if I can even get, okay, now I'm seeing it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, so. Uh, fill that in at your leisure. As you're doing that, I'm actually going to be uh, doing a little bit of terminology. Um, so when I say plan commission, there's actually many different uh, commissions, committees, and boards throughout the state that may have similar names and similar roles. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so plan commission is typically a term that's used by cities, villages, and many towns um, that have adopted village powers. Typically, a Plan Commission has seven members, of which at least three of them are required to be citizen members. However, towns, smaller towns with a population less than 2,500 uh, may reduce that to five members. Plan Commissions are typically appointed for three-year terms beginning in April. Okay, This is in contrast to a town zoning committee, typically in uh, counties where they, where they do not have uh, general zoning. Uh, when they have first appointed uh, zoning committees, um, they've stuck with that terminology. Um, and so this is um, meant for towns without village powers. Five members are typically included on this and they're appointed by the town board. And then at the county level is where we have the most variation. There's actually three different options. One option is to appoint a standing committee of the county board. And I believe this to be the most um, frequent or most popular option. The second option is to actually appoint a plan commission composed either wholly or partly of non-county board members. And the third option is to designate an existing body. Okay, and so terms of office vary depending upon which option you go with. Elected officials certainly have two-year terms coinciding with office, whereas those who are appointed would have three-year terms. So counties get pretty creative with the name of this county uh, zoning agency, um, land use and planning, uh, committee, planning and zoning committee, um, as well as a, a ton of other responsibilities might be wrapped into the title of this. So um, when I talk about the plan commission, I'm referring to all of these bodies. So the zoning committee, planning and zoning committee, whatever you call it locally, I'm referring to that. And the role of the plan commission is really to advise the governing body on broad planning and zoning and other land use type matters. Okay. I also want to point out this is distinct from the zoning board, uh, the zoning board of adjustment or zoning board of appeals. If your community has zoning, you're required to have that body as well. And they are considered an independent quasi judicial body that's responsible for variances and administrative appeals. So that was a, a lengthy introduction. Uh, why don't we go ahead and share the results from the poll? Uh, but I wanted to make sure we're all on the same page. 
So what I'm seeing um, in terms of who's attending, about a quarter of you are elected officials. 59% uh, are planning commission members. We do have a few uh, zoning board of adjustment and appeals members, uh, a couple of staff, a, a handful of clerks and administrators. I find, especially in smaller communities, they are oftentimes um, responsible for a lot of planning and zoning type matters or for um, serving uh, in a staff role to, to assist the plan commission. So I'll, wait, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. If you're still seeing the poll results, you can just use the little X out box at the top. All right. So I went pretty quickly through um, how plan commissions are uh, formed and what their composition is. If you do have additional questions on that, a great resource that I'd recommend is the plan commission handbook. And you can find that uh, linked on our hand, sorry, on our website. Um, right next to that is also the zoning board handbook. Those are both freely available if you want to view them electronically, and you can also order hard copies. All right, so I promise I would frame your role in terms of the tools that you're likely to be using. So three of the most common land use tools used in Wisconsin are as follows. The comprehensive plan, the zoning ordinance and the subdivision ordinance. All right, so at a high level, the comprehensive plan is, is really a future oriented document. It describes where you want to go, what your future vision is and how you're gonna get there. How are you going to achieve your vision? What are you gonna to do to implement that vision? The zoning ordinance and subdivision ordinance as their title suggests are both regulatory tools. Uh, so zoning regulates land uses, density, dimensions of lots and structures and so forth. Uh, zoning, um, I would say is actually for some communities more common um, and used on a more frequent day-to-day -day basis uh, because it can apply to new development as well as existing development. It's really concerned about uh, how land uses interact within your community and how you're making sure that they're compatible. That's in contrast to a subdivision ordinance, which comes into play typically with new development. Um, it's about creating a legal description for property and regulating the division of land. Um, you might think of this as a typical subdivision, but it can actually apply beyond that. Um, but it's really concerned about the layout of, of new development of the land, the lots, the streets, uh, and how it all, excuse me, how that all interconnects and what public improvements are provided. So I'm going to actually go into each of those three tools in turn and talk specifically about what decisions you might be tasked with um, and what your role is as a planning commission. I'll pause here, however, if you do have questions throughout, I just wanna remind you to find that chat function. I'm also gonna be asking you to respond to a few questions just to make this a little bit more interactive as well. Okay. So rather than starting with the legal definition of a comprehensive plan, I actually like to start with this quote, and I've been using it for a long time uh, because I think it really nicely captures what a comprehensive plan is. I found this in the prologue to a plan for the village of Little Shoot. They've probably since updated their plan two times over. Uh, but what they said is, when we plan, we're deciding how we want our community to look, function, and feel. We create a comprehensive plan, but this is not just the title of a document, it's the description of a process too, okay? So I like how this describes what it is that the plan is trying to achieve, but it also talks about how it's a process. It's a process of involving your community, of getting all these people together, not just plan commission members, but the general public, your elected officials, others who need to have a say in the future of your community and deciding what that is and how you're gonna start moving in that direction. Then from a, a definitional perspective, uh, this is what state statutes say about the comprehensive plan. So your plan is a guide to the physical, social, and economic development of your community over a 20 year period. It includes goals, objectives, policies, programs, quite a bit of data and maps, as well as recommendations for how to implement the plan. Okay. It's comprehensive because you're required to address nine different elements. I like to think of these as topics. Many communities will actually organize their plan around these different topics or elements. 
Um, so this is pretty diverse. You can see things um, like housing, transportation, uh, utilities and community facilities, natural resources, economic development, and so forth. I know that a lot of communities are currently updating their plans, and I know that there's also a lot of communities that are trying to do it on their own. They may not have um, a whole lot of uh, financial resources to get this done. So one thing that I've been encouraging a lot of communities to do is to think critically about how it is that you want to use your plan and what are the most important elements to you and really focus your update efforts on that. I've also been seeing communities that are active with planning where they're adding in additional elements. Maybe they're thinking about sustainability or they're thinking about public health or they're thinking about aging and they're adding that in either as a separate element or as a thread um, that may run throughout their plan. Those are all things that you're welcome to do. Uh, the, the, planning, uh, the planning law really provides a framework for the plan and the content of the plan, how you craft the plan is up to you and your local community. Okay. Um, so there is also a um, process laid out in state statutes. You're required to update your plan once every 10 years. Some communities will do so on a more frequent basis. Others will, um, kind of hold out and wait for that 10 year period and try to really think of this as a future oriented document. Um, so there are some process steps that go along with it, including written public participation procedures. At a minimum, you need to have a, a public hearing uh, prior to adopting your plan. Uh, and you also need to distribute the plan for review and comment. Okay, there is a specific role laid out for the plan commission to recommend the plan by resolution and for the governing body to adopt the plan by ordinance. I don't want you to leave thinking that that's the only role of the plan commission. The plan commission actually has a very strong role within uh, the realm of planning. Um, the, the role of the plan commission is really to be um, the recommending body, the one who is out there kind of hitting, hitting the streets, hitting the pavement, thinking about how it is that we're gonna connect with our community, how do we invite the public to participate in this process? What are the opinions of others? Um, what types of policies and programs and ideas do we want to explore within our plan? So they're really the ones on the ground trying to help develop this plan. You may or may not have staff or consultants to assist you. Um, and so if you don't have that support, uh, it's typically the plan commission who's doing the heavy, list, heavy lifting to develop the plan and to involve the community. Okay. One last piece that's included in the comprehensive planning law is a consistency requirement. Um, there's not actually a requirement that every community have a comprehensive plan. It's kind of a, a backdoor requirement. Um, so if you have zoning, land division, or official mapping tools, when you update those tools, they need to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. Okay, and so there, there is a little bit of a definition for consistent now provided in statutes, and that means uh, it furthers or does not contradict the objectives, goals, and policies contained in the plan. You know, a lot of people look at that and say, well, what good does that do me? The takeaway here is that the plan uh, needs to be supportive of the ordinance and vice versa. They're not, they should be exact duplicates. The plan is that future visionary guiding document whereas the regulations are gonna um, regulate what happens on the landscape today. So there's gonna be some differences in terms of what your focus is and how much detail you have in a plan versus an ordinance. Okay, I like to think of things visually. And so when I do that, this is how I lay it out. So graphically, I think of the plan as this overarching document it's guiding you into the future. And then there's a variety of tools that you oftentimes use to implement the plan. The three listed here are the ones that are required by law to be consistent. Um, there are additional regulatory tools you can use. And there's also a variety of non-regulatory tools. So you might have more detailed plans, neighborhood plans, um, you know, a lake management plan, et cetera. You might have specific programs. Sometimes those are voluntary or incentive-based. Um, and then funding is oftentimes a big piece of this. And you may have, you know, your budgets, a capital improvement plan. Those pieces all work hand in hand with the plan uh, to help implement what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, the plan itself is not 
self-implementing. That's why you oftentimes hear that moniker, uh, the plan just sits on the shelf. Um, that's because you haven't taken additional steps to help implement it. All right, so I wanna pause here. This is where I'm gonna ask for you all to participate um, using the chat function. The first two questions are for you to think about on your own, and I actually have a map to show you the status of planning. What I'd like for you to do here is actually answer this third question, or if you've given some thought here, you're also welcome to answer the four, fourth question. So think, do you have a copy of your plan? As a plan commission member, you should, or you should know how to find it. When did you last update it? Was it within the last 10 years? How are you using your plan? I always find the responses to this one really interesting. And it's okay. Some communities say, you know what? We haven't used it a whole lot. Others have a lot of answers for this. And so I would appreciate seeing and hearing how it is that you're using your plan. And then lastly, start to think about what updates are needed. You don't necessarily need to show that um, in the chat or share that, um, but certainly maybe make some notes for yourself and think about as a plan commission member, perhaps you need to recommend thinking about some updates. How are you going to address new topics, new issues that are relevant to your community? Okay, as you're typing, I also wanna share, um, there was a recent uh, inventory effort by the Wisconsin Department of Administration, and they looked at the status of comprehensive plans, zoning ordinances, subdivision ordinances, uh, just to see uh, what's out there, what's widely available on the internet, um, who's adopted what, uh, and these are the results for comprehensive planning. So what you see here, the communities shown in blue, either at the county level on the left, all of those counties shown in blue, and then on the right, all of these towns, cities, and villages shown in blue are communities that have recently updated plans within the last 10 years. Those shown in gray, this was as of last summer, um, have plans that are older than 10 years old, and then those that are shown in the lightest shade of gray, um, no plans were able to be found. Doesn't mean they don't exist. Um, they just weren't able to be found in this inventory. And I know that there's actually some communities, uh, counties, as well as municipalities who've made updates um, since the time at which this map was created. All right, so let me come back and revisit these questions. So I'm seeing a, actually, you guys are great at participating. All right. Um, so we just updated the housing section. Um, so we just passed it. So another person updating their plan and just had our first quarterly report on the plan from each department and how they're working on things. So it sounds like there's a staff implementation function here. That's great. Um, the land use map is used when evaluating rezone requests. That's most frequent. I hear that around the state a lot. Okay, another person said we use it for land divisions, CSM, site plans, et cetera, uh, when looking at properties with extensive natural resources uh, for making recommendations at the Regional Planning Commission level. And, and I think that's a really good point. There's a lot of really valuable maps that are typically found in comprehensive plans, especially natural resource type maps. Um, so it's a great resource for that. Okay, some updates I'm seeing here needed to that map additional planning processes happening. Okay, rezone requests, we heard that. All right, oh man, you guys all very much participated. All right, so I'm gonna go back to a summary. These are the common answers that I hear around the state. So people are, are actually consulting their comprehensive plan when making development decisions. The most frequent example of that that I hear is when providing input from the town level to counties on rezones. Um, I've been hearing more and more about communities that are um, using their comprehensive plan to cap to prioritize capital spending and road improvements. That's particularly relevant um, for towns and counties. Um, and then I've also been hearing there's there's a ton of grants out there right now. And so the comprehensive plan is a really great place to lay out data, to lay out future priorities, and you can oftentimes use that to support grant applications. I've seen many, many applications where they may require for you to have certain plans, um, sometimes beyond the comprehensive plan, and I've also seen where they're giving bonus points um, for having prioritized or taking action um, to include different projects or ideas within your plan. All right. 
So I didn't get to read through all of those chat functions, but certainly if you do have questions, Lynn's gonna be monitoring the chat. So she's gonna help filter out and write down if there's some questions, we'll return to them at the end. Um, but that's all I have for the moment on planning. I wanna shift gears into zoning uh, because that's oftentimes one of those uh, most frequently used tools within communities. Actually, Lynn, did you see any additional questions that we should answer while it's still relevant? If yes, not. there's one here, Becky, that I would recommend. It's the okay. last one. Um, it says, we also use town comp plans and most are old. At what time do these town plans become obsolete? You've probably heard that question before. <laughs> I'm going to guess that this was a county, perhaps, that responded to yes. this. And so this is a great question, actually. Um, <laughs> So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, the town and county in terms of zoning. It's always a cooperative exercise. Um, either the, the, the county is responsible for approving a town plan if they adopt their own, or um, if the towns choose to participate in countywide zoning, then the towns need to approve of that countywide zoning ordinance. Okay, and the towns who participate in county zoning also have um, veto authority over rezoning decisions. I'm kind of getting into the weeds here, but I'm gonna come back to this. Um, so towns should absolutely be using their future land use map found within their comp plan to guide those rezoning decisions, especially if they wanna veto a county zoning, um, a county uh, zoning ordinance amendment or a rezone. Um, Ultimately, however, it's the county's job on the, the vast majority If the county um, has adopted the zoning ordinance. It's the county's job to rely upon their plan when they're making consistency decisions. So the only time that a um, town plan would come into play is on that um, veto of a rezone or potentially if your ordinance asks for it on a conditional use uh, decision. So I, 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 there's not clear guidance from a legal perspective could a legal challenge be uh, placed out there if, a, 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 let's say, a town is trying to veto a county zoning decision and their plan's really old? Yeah, it probably could happen. I haven't seen it yet, so there's not clear legal guidance on this. What I would say is, to the best of your ability, if you are updating your plan at the county level, reach out to your towns and offer to help provide that mapping assistance, because that's oftentimes the biggest hurdle for towns is, how do we collect the data? How do we update our maps? Uh, and so that's a really fantastic service that counties can be providing and working uh, cooperatively with their towns. In the end, it's probably gonna make for smoother decision-making at the county level. That's a great question. All right, so with that, I think we're gonna transition into zoning and I'm gonna ask you once again, uh, to use that chat box and interact with me just a little bit. Um, so I want to invite you to answer this question. Why do we have zoning? What is the purpose of zoning? How does it function in your community? What do you see as its value? I always get diverse responses, um, but usually there's some commonalities. So I'll give you a few moments to start adding a few responses there. Uh oh, you're not as quick this time. <laughs> well, what I'll go ahead and do is reveal some of the things I added. There's not a right or a wrong answer here, um, but I'll I'll tell you um, what I think of as why we have zoning. Uh, zoning is is one tool in our toolbox, um, and it can help us to achieve a variety of community goals. One thing you're going to see uh, within the purpose statement of all zoning ordinances is to protect public health, safety, and welfare. Okay, when it comes back to the legality of zoning and early case law, this is why we have zoning and this is why it's been upheld. But you could actually use zoning in many different ways and the, the, the breadth with which different counties and municipalities around the state have modified zoning ordinances or adopted uh, special types of zoning is, is really quite interesting. So there's a lot of different types of natural resources protection Shorelands, wetlands, floodplains are examples of that. Um, to a certain extent, communities are regulating community character and aesthetics. Um, they're also thinking about the interface between um, public and private 
property, as well as protecting um, those investments, whether it's public or private investments. Okay. Lynn, what are you seeing in the chat? What are some of the additional um, ideas that you're seeing if, if they are different than what I've already listed? Um, sure. Um, to separate conflicting uses, to have um, consistency, to guide the use of land toward the plan, um, relative security for the future landscape, like you said, protect and preserve natural resources. Um, I think that's most of it. Right. Thanks. Whoops, jumped a little far ahead there. All right, so let me um, share that inventory that I mentioned earlier uh, for zoning status. What you'll see on this map is uh, general zoning. Uh, in green are the counties that administer countywide, I shouldn't say countywide, that administer uh, zoning ordinance at, at the county level. So they work cooperatively with the towns to administer a countywide zoning ordinance that applies to the towns. Uh, those areas shown in this light gray actually have no zoning, okay? And then um, those shown in blue have town zoning, or it's a little harder to see. Um, if you were to zoom in on the cities and villages, they have city or village level zoning. I'd say the vast majority of cities and villages do have zoning. There's actually a handful of cities and villages that have adopted have worked with neighboring towns and have adopted extraterritorial zoning, which is a complete partnership between the town and that city or village. Um, and they're regulating the areas outside of their borders uh, cooperatively. Uh, and then there's also a variety of municipalities that have shoreland, wetland, and floodplain zoning. Those last tools are actually required at the county level. Okay, so in addition to general zoning, General zoning is where we're thinking about across the community, what are the different land uses we want? We have different zoning districts like residential, commercial, et cetera. Um, oftentimes on top of that, we may apply special types of overlay zoning, uh, things that apply to a specific resource area. Um, that type of zoning typically applies in addition to the base zoning districts. So examples of that would be uh, things like shoreland zoning or floodplain zoning, where they'd apply within a certain distance from a lake or a river. Another example of this would be a wellhead protection zoning district that, again, might um, apply within a certain distance of, of a municipal well or within the recharge area of the well. Lynn just did a webinar yesterday that talked about tools um, like wellhead protection zoning. So there's a variety of options here. Okay, so I just want to um, go into some of the basics of zoning. What does the zoning ordinance look like? Um, I know some of you are very new to these tools. Okay, so zoning includes two components. One is the map. I I gravitate I gravitate towards visual, so this is what I think about first. So a zoning map divides a community into different zoning districts. So you might have commercial districts, residential districts, industrial, conservancy, etc. Okay, then there's the text of the ordinance. The text, and, and there may be additional uh, tables or graphics um, describing some of these regulations as well. Um, the text describes regulations that either apply community-wide or within a specific district. Okay. If you look at um, kind of the typical layout of a zoning ordinance, there's not one distinct model, but these are the um, components that you'll typically see. So the purpose statements, legally, why do we have zoning? What's our objective? Um, the zoning districts that exist within your community, what uses are allowed in, for various districts, dimensional standards, so the measurements, um, development standards, and then lastly, administrative procedures. So I'll go through some of those in turn. Um, so these are examples of zoning districts. This is a fairly urban example. You can see here, this is kind of typical terminology. Along the left side, we have these R1 through R6 districts. A lot of people will use acronyms like this, R standing for residential, and then oftentimes a number that kind of helps denote what density is allowed. Okay, so that you may also have a variety of commercial districts, industrial, mixed use districts, and so forth. 
one takeaway from this is that um, there's no magical terminology. Every community creates their own zoning districts. You might see some similarities between ordinances, oftentimes because similar people created those ordinances or they started with the model or they looked at their neighbors, um, or maybe it's a town who's following the county lead. Uh, but I want you to know that you have the ability to have as many or as few zoning districts as you want and to call them and to include different regulations within them that are best suited to your community. Okay, so then for any given zoning district, you're also typically going to have a set of uses that are allowed or not allowed within that district. So we have three major categories here. I like to use the stoplight analogy, green mean, meaning go, <laughs> red meaning stop, okay? So a permitted use is a use that's listed for a given zoning district and it's allowed by right. Okay, it's not a discretionary decision. This is something that if it's listed, you got the green light as long as you meet any other uh, dimensional or development standards. This is something that's granted by a zoning administrator, so a staff level decision. Okay, you get a zoning permit, maybe a land use permit, whatever you call it locally. Anything on the far right here, anything that's not listed or that's expressly prohibited in your ordinance um, is not allowed. Okay. And then lastly, there's this interesting middle category. Okay, these are called conditional uses. Some people will use the term special exception or special exception use. This is a use that's also listed for a given zoning district, and it's allowed if it meets the ordinance standards and conditions imposed by the local government. Okay, so this is um, something that can be assigned in your ordinance either to the Zoning Board of Adjustment or Appeals to the plan commission or to the governing body. Okay, so this may be a decision that you're tasked um, with making. I have just a, one or two more slides on this later. Um, so I, I will revisit this idea. But at a high level, I wanna illustrate this. So what might this look like within a community? Um, so let's just say we have a, a given residential district, some examples of Permitted uses might be single family homes, maybe uh, townhomes or multi multifamily units. Okay, some examples of conditional uses, things that seem appropriate and would generally be allowed, but you want to make sure that they're the best fit. So in a residential district, uh, perhaps you have a bed and breakfast, maybe a small neighborhood child care, uh, maybe a little corner store that was converted from a house. Okay, um, what's different between conditional uses and permitted uses is that the local government oftentimes adds standards, additional standards directly within their ordinance, and they also have the ability to attach conditions to regulate potential negative impacts. So that could be things like parking, signage, hours of operation, the size of the operation. So how many children might be allowed at a daycare? How many rooms in a bed and breakfast, for example, to make sure that it's still compatible with that neighborhood or residential district. Okay, and then on the far right, prohibited uses, things that are either unlisted or specifically not allowed in a residential district, a Starbucks. <laughs> Someone was very sad when I said this at our last workshop. They wanted Starbucks in every corner. Uh, mini warehouses, industry. Those are all things that are probably incompatible with the residential district. Okay, So again, the specific name of the district and the specific uses that are allowed by right or conditionally are things that are unique to your ordinance. Okay, You have the ability to craft what your ordinance says, what's allowed. I've seen a growing number of communities moving away from entirely text-based ordinances and they're actually listing um, permitted and conditional uses in more of a table uh, type format. So this is um, kind of a cartoon version of that, but let me show you how this typically works. Okay, so at the top here, we have different zoning districts for a given community, okay? So intense egg, light egg or culture, rural residential, single family, et cetera. And then on the left, oftentimes there's different uses that are grouped um, by some general categories. So you might have a set of 
agriculturally related uses, maybe residential type uses, commercial type uses. So you can look, let's say I was interested in my community in having uh, chicken, backyard chickens. Well, <laughs> some people regulate that through zoning. There's other ordinances that could do that as well. Um, so let's say I look that up, residential poultry and beekeeping, where would this be allowed? All right, so let's say I'm, um, that's really important to me and I'm thinking about where I want to uh, purchase a home in the community. Um, I could go in, so P stands for permitted, that's the green category. C stands for conditional, uh, that's the yellow category. And then this little line stands for prohibited. So I would know by looking at this table that backyard chickens or poultry raising in general is allowed in both of the agricultural districts as well as the rural residential. It's allowed by right. Um, and then it's conditionally allowed within a single family or a multifamily district, and it's not allowed in a commercial district. Okay. All right. One other piece that you might see um, within your ordinance are different development or dimensional standards. Um, again, I've been recommending to communities as they're updating and tweaking their ordinances, if you can add in tables and graphics to help illustrate this, it makes it easier for you as a plan commission member, um, interpreting and finding um, things and makes it easier for planning and zoning staff, as well as for residents within your community to understand what the regulations say. So these are some examples of typical dimensional standards, regulations, for example, regulating um, lot size, minimum lot width, depth, et cetera. Maybe you also have a density standard setbacks from the front yard, rear yard, side yards, lot coverage, how much impervious surface can you have uh, versus kind of green areas where water can infiltrate. Height is another common one. You may also have standards, um, again, related to parking, landscaping, lighting, signage, et cetera. Okay, and lastly, um, another section you're typically gonna find in your ordinance are administrative procedures. Okay, this tells you who does what, on what timeline, and typically what the criteria are for making decisions. Okay. So if there is one takeaway from what I'm talking about in terms of zoning, I want you to be familiar with this high level terminology. And here are the types of decisions that I want you to be able to distinguish. So a permitted use versus a conditional use, we talked quite a bit about that. Um, the next the next decision is also something that you're going to be tasked with as a uh, plan commission member, and that is thinking about how do we change the ordinance, so rezoning or zoning amendment, uh, and I'll talk just a bit more about that. And then lastly, two decisions that are assigned, that are assigned to your zoning board would be a variance, which is essentially a relaxation of an ordinance standard that can be allowed by the zoning board when specific state standards are met. This is meant to provide relief in um, extreme circumstances. And then lastly, administrative appeals. So let's say there's a contested zoning decision or um, perhaps somebody's questioning how the zoning administrator interpreted a zoning ordinance provision. Um, that's what an appeal is. That is something that would also go to the zoning board. All right. So I wanna review then uh, who does what? And this would be a good time if you have some specific questions on zoning uh, to be adding them to the chat box. Okay, so at the top here, I've laid out some of these different bodies we've talked about, staff, plan commission, governing body, and the zoning board. Okay. So first, when we think about who writes the ordinance, who amends the ordinance, um, if you have the luxury of staff, um, they can do a lot of that heavy lifting. Uh, it is often, it, sometimes in smaller communities, this, this job does fall to the planning commission, okay? At a minimum, they're required to make a recommendation on um, the adoption of a zoning ordinance as well as amendments to it. The final decision on that goes to the governing body. It's your city council, county board, village board, et cetera, okay? Then in terms of specific decisions, Permitted uses are a staff function, so your zoning administrator. Conditional uses, again, could be assigned to one of three bodies, including your plan commission. Okay. Variances, 
and administrative appeals. Those all go to your Zoning Board of Adjustment or appeals. Okay. One thing I want to, let me back up. You can see on this last slide, I color coded these. So ordinance adoption or amendment is shown in green, and then all of these specific decisions are shown in pink. Uh, and then there's also some gray things, okay? So I've now laid this out. There's actually two different major types of decisions that plan commissions oftentimes make. Um, and you kind of dance back and forth between these functions. So one function is legislative. This is where you're... Um, creating plans, you're creating ordinances, or you're amending them. This is a legislative function, and you have a whole lot of discretion. You have broad discretion. That's why I've indicated with this high bar here, okay? Again, this is the responsibility of the governing body, but they're doing this with the recommendation of the plan commission. When you're working on these tools, updating those tools, you're functioning in a legislative capacity. I want to contrast that with when you're applying the ordinance to specific um, applications, okay? You have a more limited level of discretion, okay? You are responsible for following the ordinance as written, and the only place you can deviate, say, for example, to add conditions to a conditional use is where you've been authorized to do that by ordinance, okay? So you have some level of discretion to help tweak a proposal to best fit um, that location in your community. Okay, and then lastly, this last, can't ignore this. <laughs> this is typically a staff function, administrative functions, where it's a fairly black and white decision, such as a permitted use, and they're following the ordinance as written. Okay, so again, when you're looking at the plan, the ordinance or amendments, rezone specifically, that's a function of the plan commission. You're, you're functioning legislatively versus when you're looking at conditional uses and applying the ordinance, that's a quasi-judicial function. The reason I lay those two out um, are because there's actually different procedural rules and rules of um, conduct that you need to follow, okay? So in that legislative capacity, um, you have broad discretion. Um, your decisions must be reasonable and constitutional. There are some limits that are in place on this. Broad public participation is encouraged. And as a plan commission, it's actually your job to seek out that public participation, whether it's through workshops, meetings, hearings, et cetera. Okay? There's very little discussion, however, um, about, there's very little concern about discussion outside of public hearings. Okay? And that's in contrast to quasi-judicial decisions. So if you are assigned conditional use permits, know that you need to be an impartial decision maker your job is not to, um, it's not a popularity contest. Your job is to follow the ordinance as written and to apply um, the ordinance to make a decision to grant or deny an application, um, to, to go through a reasonable process of gathering public input through a public hearing, fact finding, um, and determining uh, the outcome of that decision. You generally have the ability to approve or deny an application and also to attach conditions. So there's a much higher level of, um, of, of conduct that is expected of you. Okay, so just to illustrate that, um, conditional uses are one place where a plan commission might move back and forth between a legislative role in terms of uh, updating an ordinance to make sure that they have the right conditional uses listed within their ordinance versus applying the ordinance. You may also be tasked with applying it and making a specific conditional use decision. Okay. Um, the last piece I want to um, discuss here, um, we talked a bit about conditional uses. I also wanna talk about zoning amendments. There's two different types, similar to how we have both the text and the map of the ordinance. We can have a text amendment, maybe where we're changing um, what uses are allowed, uh, what the dimensional requirements are. Typically you're changing something that applies to an entire district or perhaps community wide, okay? Uh, you can also have map amendments. Those map amendments, again, maybe you're completely updating your your zoning map, you're changing uh, district boundaries, you're adding new districts. Um, those are all legislative decisions. 
You can also uh, be tasked with making rezoning decisions. That specific term is when you are applying the ordinance. Let's say there's a request to change from one zoning district to another. That's typically called a rezone. Technically in Wisconsin, that's a legislative decision. Um, so in all cases, again, those broad decision criteria come into play. Um, what some communities do, however, is that they caution for when you're applying it to a specific uh, individual decision that you think of it more of a quasi-judicial decision, that you're impartial um, in that you're applying the ordinance standards. By and large, um, what does that mean? What could that look like? Um, some communities have no standards for rezones and others have been using uh, their comprehensive plan in ways to help guide rezone decisions. And they've also been adding in specific criteria to their ordinances. So what might that look like? Okay, so in terms of a rezone, um, these are pretty high level standards, but this may be something that you find in your ordinance. Um, the amendment will not be detrimental to the property in the immediate vicinity or the community as a whole. There will not be adverse impacts on the ability to provide adequate public facilities or services. Um, the, there will not be uh, adverse impacts on the natural environment, air quality, water quality, noise, uh, stormwater management, et cetera. Okay. So again, not every community has rezoning standards, nor are they required. Uh, what I found as a plan commission member myself is that sometimes it's helpful just to have this checklist. Some communities will include this in their comp plan, uh, and some will include this directly in their zoning ordinance. Um, the last two slides I want to talk to you about zoning uh, relate to consistency. Um, so I mentioned earlier uh, that rezones uh, need to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. So how are communities using their their plan to help guide zoning decisions. I want to show you two examples. One involves maps. Uh, this is an example from the village of Mount Horeb. Um, this happens to be in an area outside of their um, existing municipal boundaries. Um, so what they've done here, let's just imagine, maybe you're the, the town, the neighboring town, or you are the, the village themselves. But let's say an area is going to be annexed or um, it, they're proposing um, a future residential development here, okay? So if you looked at your future land use map, okay, this is just the top northwest corner of it that I zoomed in on. Um, let's say here's where you wanna put your subdivision and you wanna rezone from an agricultural area to residential. Um, here's what the plan says. Development of this area is conditioned on the improvement of a new north-south collector road, okay? So how might you use that guidance to think about whether or not a rezone is appropriate, okay? You could start going through and asking, is this road in place? No, okay. So is it maybe in our capital improvement plan or our road plan? Um, let's say it's not, or you don't have adequate funding for it. Then you might be going down the path. Uh, is the developer able to help provide this road as part of this uh, rezone and subdivision request? If not, if you can't answer that um, you have the ability to provide this road, this would be a real good reason to say that, no, we're not ready to rezone and allow development in this area. Okay. The last example I want to show you, I've seen a growing number of communities use tools like this. This is where they're trying to help uh, translate between the plan and their ordinance. So you can see on the left, we have future land use category uh, shown. Uh, these are, would be the mapping colors. And then on the top, we have guidance. What are some typical zoning districts that could help implement those categories? So let's say commercial is shown on your in your plan. How does that translate to zoning? There's actually four different zoning districts listed. So B2 general, business is what's preferred, and there's some other options that could help implement this. Highway business, planned unit development, or agricultural business. Then the piece that I really like is also that they have some development policies. So the one I've circled here is time rezoning to when public sanitary sewer and water services are available and a specific development proposal is offered. So this kind of gets at the crux of how are our plan and uh, specifically the future land use map versus the zoning map different. 
I just want to remind you that that plan is visionary. Um, it's future oriented. It talks about what you want to see in the future versus the zoning ordinance talks about what is allowed today. So a table like this helps you move from one to the next, and it helps you determine at what point is it appropriate to change zoning districts, to allow growth, to allow new types of uses? What policies, what infrastructure do we need to have in place? Okay. 